So this is our uh, third lecture in exergy. We've talked about exergy for a closed system. We need to move to exergy for an open system. Let's start with this problem. Heat transfer by conduction occurs through the wall of an oven. The inside air temperature is given 125 degrees C. The inside wall surface is 115. The outside wall surface is 35. And the outside air is 25. So we make a sketch and we say that temperature 1, temperature 2, temperature 3, temperature 4, going from the highest to the lowest. This is air on the inside. This is air on the outside. This is the inside wall, and this is the outside wall of the oven. And so in between 2 and 3 is the wall. And so we can actually put numeric values, 125 degrees C. We want to convert that. That's 398 Kelvin. We might as well convert them to Kelvin right away. Add 273, because we anticipate an exergy. An exergy flow, we need absolute temperatures. The the uh, 115 turns into 388 Kelvin. The uh, 35 degrees C turns into 308 Kelvin. And the 25 degrees C turns into 298 Kelvin. So you think about this is a wall, wall, air on the other side. And what do we have? We have conduction. The rate of heat transfer is... 1,200 watts through the wall. I would say Q dot is equal to 1,200 watts. Good symbol for that? Q dot? Sure. Determine for part A, exergy destruction in the wall. What symbol are we looking for for the answer part A? And what are the anticipated SI units for part A? I'm going to pause, I'm going to walk around, and when I get three people to give me the right symbol and units, then I'll move on. So sometimes we're asked to solve for the rate of exergy destruction per unit of mass flow through the system. And uh, sometimes we're just, put a D on that E, sometimes the amount of exergy that is destroyed it, sometimes we're interested in calculating the rate at which exergy is destroyed. Um, this one would be like kilojoules per kilogram, or really kilowatts per kilogram per second, if you want to think of it that way. But how about this one? This would be like kilojoules, and this one would be like kilowatts, right? The kilo you don't really need. It can be watts. But for of these three, which one is the one that we need for this problem. The third one. The third one, right? Because the hint is really in here that we're given the flow of heat through the system. With that flow of heat, we know that coming into this oven through that wall, we have an exergy flow with that heat, and we have an exergy flow with that heat going out the other side. And so it's really a flow of exergy due to the heat transfer or with the heat transfer. All right. So, uh, well, Professor, then, why didn't they say the rate of exergy destruction? That would have been a lot clearer. I know, but that's what this world is. It's sometimes a little confusing, you know. Um, that's just what it is, right? All right. But you have to look at the wording as well as the, the whole problem. So how do I calculate this term right here. How do I calculate that? Some people already said, look, at if I can get sigma dot, the rate of entropy generation, I'm done. I'll multiply that by the dead state temperature, and I have it. That's one way, and it's a good way. It'll work. What's another way? Exergy balance for the control system. Here, because we have no mass transfer, it's an open system, closed system. There's no M dot, so really it's a closed system analysis, but it's on a rate per unit rate basis. So what do we have? We have the flow of exergy in with the heat equal to the flow of exergy out with the heat. And the destruction. 
It's a balance equation, that's all it is. So what comes in must go out or be destroyed. That's it. What's our equation for how it comes in? 1 minus T naught over TB coming in. I'm going to say in at the surface 2, so that's TB2, divide times Q dot equal to 1 minus T naught divided by TB3 times Q dot plus exergy destruction, rate of exergy destruction. So you probably noticed this already. I don't know if I mentioned it already. What does that term remind you of? 1 minus a lower temperature divided by a higher temperature? Looks a lot like a Carnot efficiency. And you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It is just like a Carnot efficiency. Can this, what I underlined in red, that part ever be greater than 100%? Nope. And it's going to be between 0 and 100%. It's a fraction. So let's say I have 1,200 watts of energy, but usable energy is not 1,200 watts. It's 30%, 40%, 50%, whatever percent it is of the usable, of the total energy is what we could convert into work, making it usable. So when we do this, this turns into point. Uh, 232 for this problem, which is uh, saying that 23% of that heat transfer is usable energy transfer in the way of being able to maximally be converted into work. And then over here, that turns out to be 0 0.0325, only 3.25%. That's <laughs> a lot lower. Just substitute the numbers. What is our dead state? 298. What is TB3? 308. And run that. What is that? Fraction. It's 0 0.0325. 3.25%. So anyway, we can then calculate E dot D for the wall, just in the wall, is uh, 239 kilo, not kilowatts, just watts. That's the answer to part A. Look good? Part B. Exergy destruction in an enlarged control volume. So now we make a larger control volume where you go from the inside air to the outside air. So maybe think about this control volume like that. What is TB1 for coming in? That's T1. <coughs> That's 398 Kelvin. Last call, Mason's here. At this point, how many minutes is it after the start of lecture? 15 minutes. So, last call. All right, officially anybody after this is late. Got to do it. And then what's the boundary temperature over here? 298. Think about it. What is the flow of the exergy with the heat transfer coming out? Somebody already said the right answer. It's zero. Zero watts of useful energy is being transferred out of the system, yet 1,200 watts of heat is being transferred out of the system. How can that be? It's going out at the dead state temperature. You could be the most clever engineer, you're not going to be able to convert that 1,200 watts to any shaft power. Right? So this is over here zero. Often what we'll do in an engineering analysis, if we're going to dump that heat to the environment, eventually we'll just have an extended control volume or a large control volume or a large system such that where you're dumping it is actually at the, bound, at the dead state temperature. It's just waste. There's no useful conversion at that point. Well, let's try and do this. 1 minus T naught over TB1, or 4. So that's 1 minus 298 divided by 298. that help? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's, that fraction is 0. So if you do it for the enlarged control volume, the 
rate of exergy destruction is like 302 watts. Answer, part B. Look good? You ready to press forward? Let's press forward. So, you have a very general exergy rate balance equation. This term is always zero for all the problems in this chapter. Well, we don't have a transient exergy problem. There's just, maybe there's one embedded in the textbook. I never solved it, and I don't want to solve it, okay? So this one's zero because we're always running steady state. And we have, uh, if you're running steady state, this term, because the control volume could go increasing, decreasing, increasing, decreasing, averaged over time, steady state, it has to be zero. It's not like continuously getting larger and larger with volume. That's not steady state. So basically, we have flow in, flow out. They're the same mass flow rates. It simplifies a little bit. And so this is an equation that we use a lot. It's basically for one inlet, one outlet, one heat transfer, one shaft work out, and steady state. Make sense? That's our exergy balance equation for a control volume. What's new for an open system? Mass flow rate. Taking with it flow exergy. Let's drive this equation. You ready for the derivation? Look good? Well, because it's in the textbook, I just sort of have it outlined here. Uh, having taught a number of times, people have told me it makes very little it's not as helpful if I spend 30 minutes on a derivation where I could spend five on it. The details are in the book if you want. But let's go through it. So you introduce a system with one inlet pipe and one outlet pipe. And we're going to start with a control mass because we have confidence in the control mass analysis. And our system is going to start and it's going to look like this with some deformed shape about ready to get pushed in. And then at the end, it's going to look like this with it some has been pushed out of the control volume itself. What's about ready to be pushed in? That amount. What's being pushed out after a delta T time later? That amount. Okay. So uh, what's the green dashed line indicating the boundary of the control mass at time T? What is the red dashed line indicating the boundary of the control mass at time t plus delta t? Notice the red dash just perfectly lines up with the boundary of the control volume here, and the green just perfectly line up with the boundary of the control volume right there. Perfect. You then have this equation. Well, what's that equation? It's our exergy balance for a closed system that is deforming, being pushed in on one side and out the other. And you have the two terms here, the change in the exergy from the final state at time t plus delta t minus the initial state at time t. So we write the t plus delta t as two parts, what's in the control volume and then what's about, well, has come out of the control volume, exited. And then at time t, it's what's in the control volume and then what's about ready to get pushed in. All right, we're going to cancel in red these two. Why? Because we're going to say it's steady state. But if you wanted the more general equation, which I showed you, those two terms don't cancel, and you get a time derivative of the total exergy and the control volume, and then it's not. You could do it for a transient exergy balance. Okay. You come over here. You have the exergy flow with what? A little bit of heat transfer. This is exergy flow with? Shaft work coming out across the boundary of the control volume. Notice this is traditional in, this is traditional out. We'll stay with that sign convention, so there's a negative sign right here. All right, um, there's an oops right here. Then we have the little bit of work associated with pushing on the boundary. That's exiting, so it's an out, and that's a PEVE. -E. That's a boundary work. It's the exit pressure times the exit volume. What is the exit volume? This volume right there. See? Okay. Plus the boundary work pushing it in. Plus you have dead state and then you had this change in volume. Well, this, this uh, volume 
is your control volume at time t plus delta t plus the exit volume. And then this volume is the t, the control volume at t plus the inlet volume. Minus the very end, you have t naught times the amount of entropy produced. Hopefully you understand that equation. It's long, isn't it? Now you start expanding these terms. And notice that anytime I see the volume that's about ready to come in, I can put that times the mass that's a, not the mass flow rate, the mass that's about ready to come in times the specific volume of that mass that's coming in. Just like this volume on the exit right here, I can replace that by the mass that's about ready to exit times the specific volume of the fluid as it exits. All right. So I uh, put it expand out these terms. This in red cancels just like this in red cancels. Uh, otherwise, I have that more generic term for transient, but let's apply it right away for steady state. We group the terms, and we move from that to this equation right here. And we get this unique grouping of terms on the inlet and this unique grouping of terms on the outlet. Well, a little bit of work shows that E plus PV plus P naught V is equal to, uh, with a little bit of uh, expansion of the terms, the difference in enthalpy minus the dead state temperature S minus S naught plus kinetic and potential energy. That's our flow exergy. It's just algebra, I hate to say it. If you really got that control volume with pushing in and pushing out, and did the tracking of the terms correctly, you will get the flow exergy. So this is like defined, this three strokes on this equal sign. It's defined as the flow exergy. Well, once we have that, we can just uh, put it in. M dot times the flow exergy going in minus M dot times the flow exergy going out. Because you take and divide the whole equation by delta T and set, take the limit as delta T goes to zero. You have Q dot, W dot, M dots, and sigma dot. There's the equation we set out to show. Hopefully I did it and it was of some utility for you. Did it help? Yeah. Okay. Let's solve a problem. Steam at 3 kilograms per second at 80 bar and 440 degrees C enters a well-insulated turbine. So maybe we draw the turbine. We put Q dots equal to zero. It's going to have W dot coming out of the turbine. Has fluid flow like this coming in at state one, going out at state two. And the steam has a mass flow rate of 3 kilograms per second. I strongly encourage you to make a table. Maybe you start with the dead state, state equal to, then zero, then one, then two. The dead state uh, pressure. So we have P naught. Well, what's P naught? Uh, that's going to be 100 kilopascal. What's uh, P1? The inlet pressure, 80 bar. Uh, what is P2? We read the problem over here. They tell us it exits at 20 kilopascal. Then the next property of interest, probably temperature. And that I would just make a generic long list to help you through this problem. P, T, V, U, H, S, and E sub F. You can add E sub F to the bottom of the list, the flow exergy. So what about the inlet or the dead state temperature is 25 degrees C. The inlet temperature is 440 degrees C. And uh, what else do they tell us about this problem? Do they give us the exit pressure? No, exit, I mean, they give us exit pressure, but not the exit temperature or other properties. They tell us the isentropic efficiency, that's a symbol used in this textbook for the isentropic efficiency of the turbine, so that's a Greek letter eta, is uh, 85% determined for part A power out of the turbine in units of kilowatts. All right, what symbol is the answer that we seek for part A? W dot T or something like that, W dot T. Okay, 
then we'll get to part B, which is entropy production rate in the turbine. That would be something like sigma dot. Okay. Then part C, exergy destruction rate in the turbine, E dot D. See that? All right. Coming from the prerequisite class thermo 1, guess what? You don't need this class to solve for A or B. That's all prerequisite. This class is only thing really added is exergy so far this semester. So A and B are like easy. True? All right. So uh, how are we going to solve this problem? How are we going to solve for part A? What is the power output? Introduce a control volume. Do the first law analysis. And what we're going to find is that W dot out of the control volume is the mass flow rate through the steam mass flow rate through the system and a difference in the enthalpies. You have high enthalpy coming in and low enthalpy going out. Well, how are we going to find H2? Well, first of all, here is H1 way down here. How can I find H1? Is there enough information already to get H1? Yes. Think of it as pressure and temperature fixed to state. It's superheated vapor. You check it in the steam tables. It's superheated vapor. And really what fixes this state one is pressure and temperature. Knowing pressure and temperature, I can go get the other properties. I can get H1. I can get V1. I can get U1. And I can get S1. S1. All right. So I can get H1. How about H2? How am I going to get H2? You really need like state 2S and state 2 actual, where both of them have the same pressure of 20 kilopascal, but one, why do I have state 2S versus 2 actual? I first use, I'm going to need this isentropic efficiency of the turbine to help it to solve for actual. So I basically think of isentropic expansion through the turbine to get state 2S. Then I use that 85% isentropic efficiency and get the actual. So uh, let me do this. It's hard to sketch it on a TS diagram, but I have on the next slide a TS diagram for steam. All right. But on the next slide, I'm going to plot. Here, I'm going to sketch it, and then we're going to go look at it the temperature entropy diagram, and I'm going to have one of these on there. What's that called? The dome. What's the point, the name of the point at the top of the dome? Critical point. And inside the dome, it's two-phase liquid vapor. This side of the dome, it's all saturated liquid. On this side, it's all saturated vapor. And if I want to put a line of constant pressure, maybe at that 8 T bar, 80 bar pressure, it may do something like go up and do something, cut across and go up like that. That would be a high pressure. If I put on a low pressure, like 20 kilopascal, it'd be a lot lower, go across, go up like that. And we're going to come out with superheated steam somewhere out in this region. And we're going to expand it through the turbine from state 1 to state 2s. Straight line down. Why is it a straight line down? Look at the x-axis. It's entropy. And if you do isentropic expansion, it's reversible. It's adiabatic, hence it's isentropic. That's where state 2s is. But then we kick in the 85%, which means it kicks out a little bit, and there's state 2 actual. Now let me show you on a larger TS diagram. Here it is, drawn to scale, using some software put out by NIST, National Institute for Standard and Technology, a government-sponsored entity. I think they're in Colorado somewhere. Great job if you try and get a job there, right? NIST. I want a job at NIST. Okay, anyway. So where is, this is our line of 8 megapascal. That's our line of 20 kilopascal. Here is the critical point. Here is S. Here is T. Where is state 1? What temperature was it at? 
440. So that's 400, that's 500, that's 420, 440. So I do the best job I can, and right there is state one. I expand it isentropically down to that low. There's state two, 2s. Two and if I do a dashed line indicating it's have some irreversibilities, there's two actual. It's in a two-phase region. Which state has a higher quality, 2s or 2 actual? Which state has a higher quality, 2 actual? You have to remember what quality is. What's quality? Mass fraction of the steam that's in the uh, vapor compared to the total, which is liquid and vapor in the two-phase region. Quality is only defined in the two-phase region. All right, so that's very good. So what we do is we come back here and we get S1. I don't know why I changed color. S1 and H1. Let me read off those values for you. So the H was uh, 3246 kilojoules per kilogram, and the S1 is 6.5190 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. That should be direct numbers on the line in the steam tables for you. So then we bring that S2 is equal to S1, and entropy and pressure, pressure and entropy fix state 2S. Now that I know pressure and entropy, I have to get the enthalpy of 2s. Well, we just discussed it's two-phase, so how do I get, let's say, a next property, quality? How do I get the quality at state 2s? S2 minus SF divided by SG minus SF. Right? It's just a interpolation with entropy. Now that I have the quality at state 2s, how do I get the enthalpy at 2s? H of f plus the quality 2s times hfg. True? And that qual that enthalpy turns out to be uh, 2146.64 kilojoules per kilogram and this quality turns out to be uh, 80.4%. You would keep more digits in your calculator, okay? So there's more digits to that than just three significant digits. But I'm giving you some numbers if you want to repeat the calculations. I encourage you to do that. Now, how do I count, use this, this uh, isentropic efficiency? Well, you calculate the work that the turbine would produce if you had isentropic expansion, which is H1 minus H2S, and you find out that it would produce a whopping 1099.5 kilojoules per kilogram of steam flowing through it. But we're not going to get that. That would be if it was 100% isentropic efficiency. We only have 85% isentropic efficiency. So what is the work of the turbine actual? Isentropic efficiency of the turbine times the work turbine isentropic. And so we only get out 934.5 kilojoules per kilogram. True? Now that I know what you actually were able to get out, energy is conserved. And that's the mechanism by which you calculate H2 actual. So H2 actual is H1 minus the work per unit mass the turbine was actually able to produce. Are you following? So this comes in at a, uh, a, lot, a little bit lower, I'm sorry, a little bit higher enthalpy of 2311.6 kilojoules per kilogram. And if you want, you go back and you can compare the enthal uh, the quality. The quality isn't, uh, it goes from 80.4, it goes to 87.4%. I'm running out of room to put all this information. But we're able to now calculate the power out of the turbine. I know that's a lot of steps. But it's the mass flow rate times that specific and it comes in at uh, 2804 
uh, kilowatts. Part B, what is the entropy production rate in the turbine? Well, just like this state was fixed by pressure and entropy, this state is fixed by pressure and enthalpy, and now I need to get the actual exit S. I need to get S2, and S2 is a function of pressure and enthalpy. Well, it's two-phase, so I calculate the quality, and then just calculate the entropy, and I find the entropy uh, is equal to S of F plus quality at state 2 actual times S of G minus S of F. And we find that that comes in at uh, 7.1922 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. 7.1922. So we, we multiply M dot times S2 minus S1, and you get the uh, answer for sigma dot entropy generation 2.02 kilowatts per Kelvin. How about for part C? Exergy destruction rate in the turbine. I'm going to pause. I'm going to walk around and I'm going to continue when I get uh, two or three, three right answers. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, they do an entropy balance here, and you have the mass flow rate times S exit minus S inlet. That's the sigma dot. That's the second law analysis. So. So this comes in to be uh, 602. Kilowatts. Some people put more than uh, three digits of significant digits, significant figures. I'd encourage you, final answer, it's required, remember, truncate down to three. Got it? Truncate and round off. All right. We already talked about this. Let's now talk about an exergetic or sometimes called the second law efficiency of a turbine. Well, we're already introduced to this, which is the isentropic. What is the isentropic efficiency of the turbine as a review? Well, it's the work out per unit mass flow through the turbine compared to what? The maximum that you could get out. It would be the inlet enthalpy minus the exit enthalpy assuming isentropic behavior, H2S. So that's what we just used. We just used this isentropic turbine efficiency. Well, there's another efficiency. It's called the exergetic efficiency or the second law efficiency. They use a different symbol for it, epsilon. I hate it. I didn't pick the symbols, but I'm trying to be consistent with the textbook of the turbine. And now, what do you think? What do you think? Well, think about, go back to the turbine. We have a well-insulated turbine, Q.0. We want a large W dot coming out, a shaft power coming out of the steam turbine or gas turbine. And we have fluid flow through the turbine. Why do we get any power out? Where does the energy come from? Where does that energy come from if it's coming, you know, it's coming out of the fluid flow stream? It's, the flow has a higher energy content then a lower energy content. We, for the exergetic efficiency, we were interested in H1 and H2S, but now we have the concept of EF, which is flow exergy. What is flow exergy in words? It's the ability to do useful work. So you think, this is what I did get out of the system compared to EF1 minus EF2. What was the change in the flow exergy? Because from an exergy balance statement around that control volume, we have that what comes out of the fluid stream 
goes into two places. It goes either the, the power, maybe I should put a subscript on that, the shaft power coming out of that turbine. That's where we want it to go. Or where's the other place it could go? Entropy generation, friction, hence exergy destruction. It could just be destroyed, wasted. We don't want that. So what we want is we want this to be 100% and this to be 0%. But guess what? Sometimes we just can't have a frictionless turbine. <laughs> so uh, you're going to have some destruction of exergy. Okay. So this ratio is going to be less than 100%. This ratio was always less than 100%. Are they equal? No. But are they close in numeric value? Yes, they are. They're very close in numeric value. Let's solve a problem. Let's continue the steam turbine problem. So what do you think part D is? Same problem. Same numbers. The only thing different is calculate the exergetic efficiency of the turbine. It should be close to 85%. It should be close to 85%. Well, how can I calculate it? Well, the exergetic efficiency of that turbine is what we actually came out of the turbine divided by EF1 minus EF2. You can go and calculate those flow exergies. That would be H1 minus H2 minus T naught, S1 minus S2, W dot over M dot. You can do, definitely do that. And we had all the H's, and I think we did all the S's, and we had the T naught. And when you run this number, you'll find that it's around, oh, what do I get, uh, um, exergetic efficiency. Great, I didn't calculate it. Oh, come on now. I calculated it somewhere. It's 82.3% uh, exergetic efficiency. Close to 85, but it's not precisely the same. There's another way. Somebody says, I remember from the exergy balance equation that you had the mass flow rate times EF1 minus EF2. I'm just rewriting the equation I just wrote. That's what comes out of the fluid stream, either goes to producing useful work or is destroyed. True? And so I could take and divide this by M dot, by M dot, get rid of this M dot, and I could put this, this is E sub up. I'm sorry, this is epsilon, the exergetic efficiency of the turbine is W dot over M dot divided by W dot over M dot plus E dot D divided by M dot, which is 1 over 1 plus E dot D divided by W dot. I mean, there's a number of ways to solve this problem. 1 over 1 plus, what did we have for the exergy destruction rate? 602 kilowatts. And what was the uh, power out of the turbine? Uh, 2804. Somebody want to run that number and see what you get? 0.823. That's better. <laughs> Thank you. So, 0.823, anybody else agree? Yes, yes. Okay, well, we'll call it that. With exergy, there's multiple ways sometimes to solve a problem. You just have to do it correctly, that's all. Well, let me go ahead and stop there, and we'll pick it up here next time. Thank you for your attention.